dear brothers and sisters, we are all the same human being. Different color, different race, different nationalities, different religion, doesn't matter. We are all the same human being. Mentally, emotionally, physically, same. and many many greetings to everyone and thank you very much for joining us today for the celebration of International Mountain Day that also coincides with awarding of Nobel Peace Prize for His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Tibet in my heart I would like to present why the mountains of Tibet matter and we have organized for you all to get inspired by and um, enjoy at the same time. Uh, we have amazing arrays of speakers and artists lined up for you all. So please enjoy and thank you very much for joining.
Tejish Le, this is Lop Sang Senge, President of the Central Tibetan Administration here in Dharamsala. Today on the International Mountains Day, my friend and a renowned artist, Dinzi Chogla, is organizing an event and I'm asked to speak on why mountains of Tibet matter. Clearly, mountains do matter. 22% of the world land are the mountains, but 13% of the world population live on the mountains. But most significantly, 50% of water for the whole world originate and come from the mountains. So mountains are very, very important. And Tibetan mountains too. 100 highest mountains ever 7,000 meters of the whole world are in Tibet. Tibet also has the third highest or the largest reserve of ice after Antarctica and Arctic. That's where Tibet is also known as the third pole. But, you know, with the uh, invasion and occupation of Tibet, a lot of Chinese army has moved in, a lot of Chinese migrants are moving in, and a lot of infrastructure developments are taking place, and a lot of mining are taking place, thereby raising the temperature of the Tibetan plateau. The Tibetan mountains are so delicate that if there's 1% rise of temperature in the rest of the world, it'll be 2% or double on the Tibetan plateau. Because of which, the glaciers of Tibet are melting very fast. Some estimate that you know, 30 to 40% of glaciers of Tibet have melted and disappeared. According to some scientists, by 2050, two-thirds of the remaining glacier of Tibet will melt and disappear. And it will be disaster for several reasons. Number one, as the temperature of Tibet rises, the permafrost, which are the frozen earth or soil, will be thawed. And underneath the permafrost, some say, you know, uh, 10,000 million tons of carbon dioxide will be leaked and it will go out in the air, so thereby, you know, creating havoc in the ozone layer. So the global warming as we know it, the pollution as we know it, will be very different if permafrost of Tibet, you know, thoughts and the carbon dioxide, and more dangerously, equal amount of methane will be leaked. So that's why mountains of Tibet glaciers of Tibet are very important. Number two, 10 major rivers of Asia uh, flow from Tibet and provide fresh water to according to one international UN agency, 1.5 billion people are dependent on fresh water originating from Tibet. According to the latest international organization by another report, in another report, 1.9 billion people are directly, indirectly, you know, benefits from the fresh water flowing from Tibet. And uh, the water of Tibet you know, affects uh, benefit people in East Asia, including China, where, you know, uh, Yellow River and Yangtze River flow and benefit millions of people, both originated from Tibet. Mekong River, Salvin River, Irrawaddy for the whole of Southeast Asia, you know, the Vietnam, in Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, all benefit from rivers of Tibet. And uh, Brahmaputra River, Indus River, Satlas River, which flows to South Asia, all the way to Pakistan and Bangladesh, all originate in Tibet. Now, if the glaciers are to melt so fast, by 2050, if two-thirds of the glaciers of Tibet melt and disappear, you can imagine the havoc it will create people downstream. Now, China has, you know, 19% of the world population, but only 12% are fresh water, which means 7% or 400 plus uh, million people in China are already facing water scarcity. Situation in Southeast Asia is bad, Situation in South Asia is 
banned, and Tibet is the water tower of Asia. And that's where all this river originate. And that's where, that's where the Tibetan mountains are so precious and sacred too. We ought to preserve the Tibetan plateau, Tibetan glaciers, Tibetan mountain for the sake of the world. So that's why mountains of Tibet matter all the way to Australia if you care about holes in the ozone layer because the jet stream over Tibet affects climate all the way to Latin America, to North America, all over the world. So hence Tibetan plateau, which is also called the roof of the world because the average altitude of Tibetan mountains are 4,000 meters high. They serve as the refrigerator or cooler for the world atmosphere. So if glaciers of Tibet is to disappear, then you can clearly imagine the havoc it will create from the point of climate change, from the point of environment. So as His Holiness Dalai Lama said, we have only one home, this earth. We have to preserve it, we have to protect it. And the mountains of Tibet are one of the most important component of this earth. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Taro playing Bounce with Wood and Yuriko play Tampula. As a Japanese, we have an old tradition. We all came from mountains into this world. Then go back there after all. Now we play one Japanese autumn mountain songs. Thank you.
from Dune Valley in the Himalaya, my loving greetings to all of you. I am a child of the mountains. The mountains have been our protectors. They have been the givers of life. My work in ecology began when women of the mountains came out to hug the trees with love, to say you can't kill the trees, you'll have to kill us before you kill the trees. I learned nonviolent action from my sisters in the Himalaya. Our studies on climate change have shown that the mountains of the Himalaya, which supply half of humanity water, that this water held in the glaciers is threatened with climate change. Not because the mountain communities use fossil fuels, but they are the worst victims. And in these mountains are the most amazing richness of biodiversity, medicinal plants that have given us Ayurveda and Tibetan medicine. And most importantly, the two things the mountains teach us are humility. In the mountain, you can't feel you are the conqueror. You have to live with the mountain in peace. The non-separation between the mountain and you teaches us that we are part of nature. And all of the wisdom of the world is being held in the mountain. As His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, the wisdom of the Nalanda tradition has been held by the Tibetans now in exile in India. And the two gems he teaches all the time are Ahimsa and Karuna, non-violence and compassion. This is the message of the mountains. We need to spread to the world so we have water, we have biodiversity, we have life, we have oneness, we have the end of wars. We have peace with the earth and peace between people.
I was born in the mountains, mountains of a small village in central Tibet, where I lived for the first 10 years of my life. Then when I was about 11 years old, my father took me to India. Uh, for several days we walked across the mountains, just me and my father. We started early in the morning and when the sun got really hot, we stopped uh, and took shelter in the caves and in under the boulders. I collected firewood and my father started a fire to make tea. Afterwards, I lied down on my back and looked into the infinite blue sky and the tall mountains that surrounded me. At that time, I was so tired that I wished I had wings to fly from one mountain top to the next. Many, many, many years later in exile, I worked in Delhi for several years and in the intense hot summer months, I wished for the cold mountain air, but of course there was no mountain in Delhi and no mountain air. I was also really suffocated and at times out of desperation I wanted to climb up something, a mountain of sort, but there were no mountain in Delhi. So I went up to the rooftop and climbed up the water tank and shouted my lungs out. Mountains are an integral part of my life as much as they are to Tibet, Tibetan people and their civilization. Some of the biggest Asian rivers come from mountains of Tibet and some of the biggest glaciers in the world are stored in mountains of Tibet. Who am I without mountains? Here in India, after 30 years in exile, I walk the mountains of Dharamsala every now and then to remind myself of who I am, to know myself better in order to tell my stories better. So in a way, mountains are an integral part of my life and mountains are uh, important for Tibet. And I hope one day I can go back home so that I can walk the mountains of my village like I did when I was uh, a child. Now I would like to read a poem uh, by a Tibetan writer living inside Tibet. This is my translation of the poem. It's called An Atoll Iron Mountain. A vulture with its feathers scattered may have its wings stretched across the space, but movements of human beings crowding in every dark joint of limbs has turned the tall mountain into an image on a curtain painted with watercolor. Rays of the sun spreading from the cracks of its pouch may have many words carved on a stone pillar. But a long scar tethered on the face of the earth shows a history of defeat that cannot be hidden from anyone. Thank you.
Delhi. I'm Bob Brown and we're filming this at the Antarctic Centre for Australia here near Hobart in Tasmania and that's relevant because the topic we're dealing with is the roof of the world, is Tibet, the mountains of Tibet and their biodiversity and if there's two regions which affect all eight billion of us human beings on this planet, they're Antarctica and the Great Tibetan Plateau. More directly, the Tibetan Plateau from which the great rivers flow that are vital to the lives of so many billions of people in Asia. The best way of managing those mountains would be to keep them under the care of the Tibetan pastoralists, the indigenous people who for millennia have been keeping that great, vital highland area, healthy, safe, and its biodiversity intact. That's much better than simply creating national parks and eliminating the Tibetan indigenous people. We made that mistake here in Tasmania. Two centuries ago, the indigenous Tasmanians were removed from what is now the World Heritage Area and we're busy trying to get their influence, their knowledge, uh, their relationship with the land back. I'd make an appeal to China. Don't repeat that mistake. Keep the indigenous Tibetan pastoralists on those pastures with their nomadic lifestyle intact, their freedom to move. Sure, make it national parks, have it declared world heritage, but keep it in the care of the people who so successfully have maintained that wild, fabulous ecosystem for the benefit of all of Asia. So much to do, such an important part of the world, such an asset for China, for India, for Southeast Asia, for millions, billions, of people. What a great thing it would be for the world if China was to keep the best custodians possible looking after the Tibetan Plateau and the mountains of the Himalayas in China. The Tibetans themselves. Go Beijing, you can do it. Turn around, learn from the mistakes made elsewhere in the world and keep the Tibetans in charge of the Tibetan plateau so that the benefits of the centuries can go forward into the future. Hello and happy International Mountains Day. I'm Andrew Locke, Ambassador for the Australian Himalayan Foundation. I'm thrilled to support this short video to promote the mountain environment. Uh, because I've long been a fan of Tenzin and his incredible music and his passion for the Himalaya. Mountains, of course, have been a major part of my life. It was my project to climb all 14 of the world's 8,000 metre peaks, the highest mountains on Earth, which I completed after 16 years of high altitude expeditioning. I've always found the mountains, particularly the high Himalaya, to be somehow both humbling and greatly inspiring. They are the embodiment of nature's immensity, its eternity. I think that they provide great wonderment, challenge and achievement. But more importantly, the mountains provide an opportunity to slow down, to distance ourselves from the noise of society and find our true selves. I'm always immensely energised by the mountains. And they are also where I feel truly grounded. They are the spiritual heart of our planet and they enrich our souls. There is nothing I enjoy more than the pure silence of just sitting and absorbing the energy in the mountains or at other times observing and unfortunately sometimes experiencing the ferocity of their storms 
and underlying power. Who amongst us doesn't feel empowered and inspired by ice-clad ridges that soar into the clouds and beyond? Who amongst us isn't tempted to explore those threatening but at the same time taunting opportunities for endeavour and trial? Okay, not every, everyone wants to climb them, but we are all stimulated by them. For me, standing on the summits of those peaks, Everest, K2, Annapurna, has never been about conquering the peaks, because all I've ever really done is earned a pass to immerse myself in nature's wonder for a short time. It has been an opportunity to see the world from a different perspective, where simplicity, natural beauty, self-reflection are the rewards and outweigh possessions, wealth, class or status. In the face of those experiences, mountains remind me of what is important in life, to value and respect our natural world and to value and respect each other. Because no matter what our backgrounds are, we are all equal in the face of such natural magnificence. But we are all also equally responsible for preserving the mountains because despite their extraordinary grandeur and strength, they are themselves also so fragile. When I look at the extent of glacial retreat in the Himalaya and the, the growing frequency of glacial dam bursts, it is undeniable that the mountain environment is suffering from climate change. Add to that the exponential expansion of mountain tourism, which unfortunately, in much of the Himalaya at least, remains virtually unregulated, and we also see an exponential increase in pollution. I've frequently been moved to absolute despair at the volumes of rubbish that litter the walking tracks and the banks of beautiful raging rivers that were once so pristine. Ironically, it seems that the more we love something, the more we exploit it. What we need to do, of course, is to value it and protect it. The mountains are perhaps one of the most graphic displays of how fragile our entire planet is. And they are an undeniable reinforcement of the fact that humans have caused this destruction and must now take action to save not just the mountains, but our entire planet. Thank God for people like Tenzin Chogol, who understand this and who so clearly appreciate the unique and essential role mountains play in maintaining balance in the natural world and perspective for humanity.
To be a Tibetan is to be of the mountains. Our homeland Tibet is the roof of the world and has the highest and largest mountain ranges on earth. For centuries, the mountains looked after us, bringing rain for our crops and animals and protecting us from the outside world. So in turn, we took care of the mountains, protecting their lakes and rivers, never grazing our animals for too long in one place and never taking more than what could be replenished the following year. To us, the mountains are sacred landscapes. They are the homes of deities and spirits that must be respected. And these beliefs ensured that we flourished sustainably on the Tibetan plateau for thousands of years. We never thought of the mountains as belonging to us, but knew instead that we belonged to the mountains. But it is not only the Tibetans who depend on the mountains of Tibet. Our homeland is the headwater of most of Asia's great rivers. It has the largest store of fresh water outside the polar regions. But today, these mountains are in serious trouble. As the world warms, fueled by the burning of fossil fuels, the ice on the mountains is melting rapidly, threatening the water supply for millions of people across Asia. At the same time, China's exploitation of Tibet's mineral resources is damaging this unique piece of the planet with consequences that are felt far beyond Tibet's borders. So there's really no time left to lose in protecting the mountains of Tibet for Tibetans and for people everywhere. May 2020 be the year we finally understand our interconnectedness with the mountains, with the rivers, the oceans, and begin a path to a more sustainable future. Whether living in Tibet or in Sydney, Australia, Tibetans will always be mountain people, and we will always defend the mountains of Tibet.
Thank you very much. Namaste. My name is Maya Chepa. I am a second vice president of Nepal Mountaineering Association and a president of Every Summiter Association. I'm the first Nepali woman to climb many mountains in Nepal, uh, like Yamadablam, Choyu, Kumari, uh, Everest three times, uh, uh, K2 in Pakistan, uh, and many more mountains. I started my climbing in 2003. So I saw many uh, big difference on the mountain because of climate change. When I went first time Mount Everest 2006, the ice pool was very beautiful and there was many ice towers we can enjoy and climb up and down. But then after 10 years, I went back again to climb Mount Everest my third time. That time I saw that all the ices are melted and they're very messy and I cannot enjoy the ice pool anymore because of climate change. Like that kind of mountains, many I see uh, during my climbing. Like uh, K2 was also the same. When we start climbing up to the summit, it was beautiful with the ice. And when we uh, came back from the summit, all the ice was melted very fast and quickly. Uh, same like in Amadablam. In uh, 2003, uh, Amadablam was my first mountain when I climbed. I still remember the mushroom bridge was full of ice and uh, many, um, uh, many snows were there. But now when I see the pictures of mushroom bridge, there was no ice. I cannot see any ice and snow in, anymore in that part because of, I think it's affected by uh, global warming. So uh, many other mountains are the same now. Uh, recently, uh, I went to Pokhara and uh, I saw the Mount Masapusri. It's also the uh, same thing. This Masapusri was normally covered by the snow, but this time I saw the mountain is very naked. Without the snow, it's not so beautiful um, to see the Machu Picchu and many other mountains are the same. I think uh, this is all affected by the global warming. So I can see the big difference between uh, four, five, six years ago and now uh, on the mountains. Uh, when I see the mountains this time, uh, lots of mountains are um, like only the rocks standing there. It looks like the rocks, only the rocks is standing there because of melting ices and glaciers also changing a lot. You can see the Kumbu glaciers and also the Valtara glaciers and the Konchananga glaciers. Everywhere the glaciers are changing and melting and the, um, we don't see the long glacier anymore. So the glacier is moving towards the mountains because of global warming, I think. So we should do something in our future, how to control this uh, melting ices and snow how to keep the mountain beautiful. Because uh, when we see the mountain, a naked mountain only with the rock, it doesn't look beautiful. So I like to see the mountain full of snow and full of ice, which is very beautiful, which is called the mountain. If there's no ice on the mountain, it doesn't look beautiful. So we all, all the climbers have to think how to control these kind of problems in future, how to keep our mountain very beautiful. Let's work together and uh, we raise the voice to save the mountains uh, and uh, at the end I would like to say happy International Mountain Day to everyone, to all the mountaineers, to all the adventurous people who love the mountains and save the mountains. Thank you very much.
Tonga Tom Taiko from Brisbane, Australia. Happy International Mountain Day, everyone. Uh, greetings. Uh, pleased to be here on International Mountain Day celebrating mountains, focusing on the majesty and importance of the mountains of Tibet and the Himalaya. I am from the west coast of Canada where we have stunning mountains in the Rockies, but if you go to Tibet, the snow caps will just blow you away. They're on a completely different scale, soaring right into the sky. So it's a very different world, a higher altitude world. And Tibetans not only like their mountains, they revere them. The Tibetan flag features a snow-capped mountain with a pair of snow lines. Tibetans long to go on pilgrimage to sacred peaks to complete a walking circuit around the peak. And here's a few photos of Tibet's magnificent sacred peaks. Kailash in the west, Kawakapo Jambayang in the east, and the tallest peak on the planet, Everest. Here's a shot taken from the summit of Everest, looking down at the Rongbo Glacier. The photo was taken by Canadian mountaineer Pat Morrow. That was his first glimpse of Tibet because he climbed up from Nepalese side. And that's the way I think we should all look at Tibet. The land of snow and ice, the refrigerator for the whole planet. The third pole, a grand repository of ice and snow and permafrost. Unfortunately, the picture has changed over the last few decades due to climate change and due to China change, uh, meaning poor management on the part of the Chinese overseers of Tibet. Mountain permafrost, for example, is th uh, thawing faster in Tibet due to excessive Chinese mining, railway construction, and shifting all Tibetan nomads off the grasslands that keep a lid on permafrost. What we're seeing now is the land of melting snows. The mountains are losing their precious coat of ice and snow a coat so important to the functioning of rivers and entire ecosystems and to food and water security for the whole of Asia and beyond. For every problem, there's a potential solution. I'm going to talk briefly here about solutions, mountain solutions. The first solution presented is from His Holiness the Dalai Lama himself in 1989. His was the first Nobel Peace Prize to be awarded on the basis of environmental protection. In his Nobel acceptance speech, he stated, the Tibetan Plateau would be transformed into the world's largest national park or biosphere. Strict laws would be enforced to protect wildlife and plant life. The exploitation of natural resources would be carefully regulated so as not to damage relevant ecosystems. And a policy of sustainable development would be adopted in populated areas. Uh, this great plan was never acted on. China simply ignored it. The Dalai Lama has pledged four lifelong commitments. The third commitment is to the preservation of Tibetan culture and environment. And we're going to see a lot more of His Holiness as environmentalist advocating for much more compassion for Mother Earth with the release of two, two new works, Our Only Home with Franz Elt, which is an interview-based book, and This Fragile Planet, a digital photo book with environmental quotations by His Holiness matched to photos from a dozen photographers. Uh, back to the solutions. Some scientists now believe that although 50% of the glacial meltdown is caused by CO2 in the atmosphere, the other 50% may be caused by a rain of black carbon, meaning small black PM2.5 particles that result from burning of fossil fuels in both China and India. Those fine particles land on snow and ice high in the mountains, attract heat from the sun, speeding up meltdown. The same fine particles get into human lungs and blacken them, and they will kill you, as in death by pollution. If the burning of fossil fuels were to cease tomorrow in that region, then within a month there'll be no more rain of black soot on the mountain glaciers. But neither China nor India appears to have the interest or the willpower to make this happen. China accounts for around a third of global CO2 emissions. Turning our backs on coal, we should be embracing cleaner, renewable resources, switching to solar power on a far grander scale. For example, in previous decades, solar could not challenge coal or hydropower for scale. It was too expensive. But that is no longer the case. In Ladakh, in northwest India, there are two solar farms under construction that will have a combined output of 7.5 gigawatts, which is far greater than what a single Indian coal-fired plant or a Chinese megadam can output. The terrain of the Ladakh, very dry, high-altitude desert, is ideal for solar, and that same terrain extends across the border into Tibet itself. Now, also from uh, Ladakh, an ingenious solution for farming and food security, the creation of artificial glaciers in the form of ice stupas. The one shown here is in Piang. It's been built up from branches and pipes with the help of the local monasteries and monks and the local people. An ice stupa stores winter water and releases it in spring when water is very scarce but most needed. In this way, an ice stupa replicates the action of a real glacier. You put about 10 ice stupas together and, and you would have enough uh, water for crops in one valley for the entire summer. Uh, across the eastern side of the Himalaya, more brilliant solutions for Bhutan. The nation of Bhutan has set aside 50% of 51% of its total land area for national parks, nature reserves, and biological corridors. It is, in fact, the only nation in the world 
to have achieved this 50% plus ratio envisaged by biologist E.O. Wilson as the half earth plan, the best way to save biodiversity. The forest cover in Bhutan is over 70% of land area, well ahead of any other nation in Asia, indeed the entire world. That forest cover is preventing leakage of methane from thawing permafrost, a very important consideration as the Tibetan plateau has the largest store of permafrost outside of the Arctic and Antarctic regions. So some conclusions. Keep it green, keep it in the ground, save Tibet's glaciers by cutting back on fossil fuels. And we need to stop thinking that it's out of our hands to deal with climate change. It can be done, we can stop the damage. But it has to be done now, not 10 years from now, not five years from now. Both China and India need to act decisively now to stop the rain of black carbon on the glaciers. And I'm gonna leave you with a final thought on Tibet. Uh, in Tibet, pilgrims carry prayer beads or malas when doing a core around the sacred peak, for example. In other cultures in Europe, we have uh, similar strings of beads. You in Italy have rosaries, in Greece, worry beads. And I think it's time, high time to start worrying, to worry a lot about the mountains of Tibet and high time to do something about it. Namaste. So with this, we come to the end of our program. And I really want to thank all our amazing speakers and artists who gave their time to join us from around the globe. So thank you to all my friends for joining us for the program. So if the words of the speakers and the music of the artists have inspired you, then I encourage you to get involved with the local Tibet support networks around you. Central Administration for Tibet, say for Australia, Australia Tibet Council, in Canada, the Canada Tibet Committee, and in America, International Campaign for Tibet, Students for Free Tibet, and Free Tibet UK. There must be a Tibetan community nearby you, so you can always ask them how to take actions for Tibet so that we can make our roof for this blue planet a better place for all of us. A special thanks to Michael Buckley and with much gratitude I thank you all for joining us for this celebration of International Mountain Day, Why Tibet's Mountain Matter. And I hope to see you all again very soon in person. Till then, please stay safe, stay mindful, and be kind and compassionate to all the beings around you. Thank you very much for joining us.
Thank you.